Suzette Martinez Standring, and welcome to It's All Right with Suzette, a half hour show on the craft of writing. And today we have a fabulous guest, Dennis Sprague, whose book, Glenn Miller Declassified, is a fabulous book on historical research connected to big band music, Glenn Miller's contribution to the war effort, and World War II history. And I am so excited to have him here today. You should know that he directs the Glenn Miller Archives at the University of Colorado Boulder. He is a board member of the American Music Research Center in Colorado and the Glenn Miller Society in Iowa. And he's a Milton resident. So I want to welcome you here today, Dennis Sprague. Thank you, Susan. I'm very glad to join you. There's been a lot of buzz in town about your book, and I am excited to talk to you about it. Um, can you tell us a little bit, we all know who Glenn Miller is. He's an iconic band leader. Mm -hmm. But what, from your very detailed research and history and involvement with his um, records and all of that, who was he as a man? Glenn Miller was a very interesting individual. Not only was he a, a top flight entertainer, he had a great sense of public uh, taste. He produced music that was always in good taste, jazz and popular music. Ballads, he was number one. He, was, he, he had a incredible uh, success between 1939 and 1942. But above and beyond all that, when the United States entered World War II, he was a patriot. He deeply cared about his country. Right. You have to remember, Glenn came from a family. He was born in southwestern Iowa. His father was a contractor for the Union Pacific Railroad, so the family moved around a lot. They ended up settling in Fort Morgan, Colorado, sugar beet field, sugar mm -hmm. beet country. He did not come from a rich or privileged background. In fact, they were what you might call a, a lower middle class background, but certainly not poor. But he was a typical mid middle American from the Great Plains and from the Rocky Mountains. And he, he was motivated. I think his dad had had some difficulty in life, so Glenn was motivated to succeed. And he did. But in spite of all of that, he felt he owed something to the young people that had bought his records, and so he wanted to go into the military and do more for the war effort once the war had started. Well, that was one of the <coughs> facts in your book that really enlightened me, mm -hmm. because I always thought of Glenn Miller as a terrific, a, a fantastic musician, mm -hmm. but I had no idea how deep his patriotism went and how his contribution um, to the war effort was so great. Can you tell us a little bit about his motivation and how he got into directing the Army Air Force Band? Well, one of the things about Miller, about how he succeeded or why, was not just the, the, that he was a good musician, he was an excellent arranger. And arranging really was his forte and what got him to the position of having his own band. Then once he had his own band, he was a good organizer. He was, everybody would say that, whether they liked him or didn't like him, they'd say he was a great, very organized man. He was a very steady, deliberate man. One of the music critics said, I never saw anybody who knew exactly what they wanted and how to get it. He was very good at that. So it worked two ways. Glenn wanted to go in and do something more for the war effort in uniform mm -hmm. that he couldn't do as a civilian. Mm -hmm. But the Army Air Forces had a commanding general named H.H. H. Arnold, Hap Arnold. Arnold was very media savvy. He was developing uh -huh, film yes. unit. He developed a film unit in Southern California with people that they enlisted from, from the motion picture industry, including Lieutenant Ronald Reagan and that he formed music radio production units to tell the story of the Air Forces. It's 1942, what's an Air Force? Mm -hmm. They're gonna have two million people and what amounted to the high tech end of the armed forces. So they needed talent to explain to the American people why, to raise money for war bonds and to recruit young people into that branch of service. Well, guess who's ready made for that role? Glenn Miller, America's number one band leader amazing that he was able to apply his incredible talents of organization and foresight into revolutionizing the whole broadcasting aspect yes. of the armed yes. forces. In fact, I think if Glenn had lived after World War II, he probably would have owned radio stations and had more of a day-to-day a, a -day role in the broadcasting industry as a producer and as an empresario as well as a band leader. But that said, the point was the Army Air Forces had a job that fit him perfectly and he 
rose to the occasion. Many musicians who worked with him in the military said, we had no problem with him. It was obvious he would, if any of the band leaders, Tommy Dorsey, Benny Goodman, Artie Shaw, if any of them had become, had gone into uniform, Glenn was the one. Now, it wasn't without its problems. I mean, can you imagine this incredible musical creative dealing with military top brass and, 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 in, and recruiting all of his friends, helping to re recruit a lot of his colleagues in, yes. in the motion picture and music industry. Can you talk a little bit about some of those barriers, obstacles, uh, challenges that he faced? Well, there were two things that happened. Mm -hmm. He had great barriers and obstacles among mid-level officers and old-line army musicians. I mean, people that had been in military music for many years were astonished when they started getting visits from and memos from a captain. And they go, how does he have so much authority? And the reason he did was the higher-ups, Arnold and the commanding general of the training command, General Yount, gave him carte blanche. They just said, sign our name. He got anything he wanted. And on t because he, he was Glenn Miller and they wanted him to succeed. Mm -hmm. So many hundreds of musicians came in contact with him, mm -hmm. although he only picked 50 for his elite unit that he led himself, which was based near New York and New Haven, Connecticut, but broadcast out of New York. And he had to fly over 50 people, right? Yes. Around the country. Can you tell us a little bit about the logistics? I mean, I found that to be kind of overwhelming. Well, the band itself didn't travel that much. He did. The yes. band, he was all over the place because uh -huh. the Air Force's training command was headquartered in Fort Worth, Texas, which is where he actually was based. Mm -hmm. But he spent all his time with the, with the men in New Haven and New York. Now, they did travel to Philadelphia, St. Louis, Chicago, but they went by train. Oh, not by okay, air. train, that's right. Because there's so, too much equipment to carry around. Although once they got to England, which we'll speak about in a moment, they did fly. They did pile their equipment into airplanes and fly around the right. air bases for now, concerts. Now, um, one of the really, I mean, your book is a terrific blend of World War II research and history and music. And one of the, the aspects of your book that I really enjoyed was Facts about Hollywood celebrities at the time, I had no idea. Like, for example, David Niven. Can you give us some, you know, examples of some of the stars that were involved when in Glenn, this war? When Glenn Miller went from the United States to England, and that's a whole other story that's in the book, why the Army Air Forces um, let him go because they were, the band was doing very well in the United States. Well, let's talk about that. They were why very did visible they let him go? Because a, a gentleman named Eisenhower, who ran <laughs> Allied forces in Europe, sent a requisition across the Atlantic to the Pentagon and said, may we have Captain Glenn Miller and the Army Air Forces Orchestra transferred to England because Eisenhower had decided that what he wanted to do was merge the uh, BBC's broadcasting work and the American Forces Network into a new unit called the Allied Expeditionary Forces Program. D-Day was approaching. It was the spring of 1944. And they wanted an all-allied radio team that was 50% American and 50% British and Canadian to entertain the troops and to give them news and information once they reached France. So they were building transmitters to transmit this new signal to France. And they thought, what unit do we have anywhere in the armed forces or the entertainment industry that can staff this new radio network? And it was Miller. So I found that to be incredibly visionary on the part of Eisenhower. Yes. And I did not know that your book really gives a terrific insight into some of these very powerful military leaders of the time. No idea. And, and, and that's when he also came into contact with people like David Niven. That's what I was going to mention. Well, mm -hmm. see, now Niven, this is an interesting story. People think of, in World War II, a lot of people in the entertainment industry went into uniform. Mm -hmm. Many, many of the stars that we know today were in uniform during the war. David was different. He had gone to Sandhurst as a young man and graduated and was in the British Army. And then some things happened. We don't know. It's kind of a murky thing, and he doesn't talk about it much in his biography. He ended up in Hollywood. So he wasn't an actor who became a soldier. He was a soldier who had become an actor. Interesting. No idea. So in 1939, when Britain entered the war, Niven went home. He put his uniform back on, and he eventually became a lieutenant colonel. He wanted to be a commando. He did go into the commandos. He wanted to fight. But of course, the British figured out he's David Niven. 
him. We could have hundreds of men as commandos, or maybe thousands, but we only have one David Niven. So they immediately put him into films and radio, which I think bothered him a lot because he, I remember in the book he, he wasn't, wasn't happy, happy because he that. wanted to be actually active in the action. Well, and he ended up he ended up getting drafted, if if you pardon that phrase, he ended mm -hmm. up getting drafted into the Allied Expeditionary Forces program of the BBC, mm -hmm. and he ended up as Glenn Miller's boss when Glenn went to England. Can you imagine that? That was such a great thing David to read was about. Glenn's boss. And Dinah Shore, you know, she was iconic in her time, and she and um, Glenn Miller butted heads. Well, in addition to having the Army Air Forces band come over, which is part of the military, mm -hmm. Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force, they became part of Eisenhower's command. The military also requisitioned and asked for civilian entertainers to come, the USO tours that came through. Glenn was not part of the USO, he was actually in the okay. military. But some of the civilians that came over while Glenn and the band were in England were Bing Crosby and Dinah Shore. Now Glenn and Bing had known each other very well in civilian life. And Bing came over, and that's a whole another story where Bing was rehearsing with the band and Glenn was kind of a disciplinarian and Bing brought in liquor to the um, rehearsal for the radio program and what could Glenn do? I mean he couldn't stop, he was Bing Crosby, he couldn't say no and Bing says oh Glenn lighten up, let him have a good time. Bing also, they were rehearsing songs and Glenn goes let's run him over again and Bing would go oh no 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 I'll be fine, when we go on the air I'll just do it and he did, you know Bing Crosby is Bing Crosby. Well Dinah Shore came as well Whereas Bing was very relaxed, Dinah was kind of uptight. She had, she had a lot to prove. She wanted to do some things, and she was as headstrong as Glenn Miller was. Uh -huh. So they kind of butted heads when they when she came over. But nonetheless, they made radio broadcasts and records together, and the the music that Crosby and Shore made with Miller, in England survives. We preserve those 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 radio discs, and so we we know what they sounded like together, and it's very beautiful. It just goes to show me, it taught me the immense power of music mm -hmm. and how it was used to uplift the morale of our military, how it was used as a bridge and a collaboration with England. Let's tell us a little bit about that collaboration with the BBC. Well, there were, there were several aspects of this. The Miller Band broadcast, it also traveled and did concerts at military bases. So their mission was to entertain the troops. Yes. But then, but then all of the, those radio broadcasts were heard by the British people, the civilians. Right. And the British people, remember, had not seen or heard American entertainers in, to this degree, night yes. after night or day after day on radio broadcasts since the late 30s. So they were starved. They had been at war for five or six years, so Miller made a huge and immediate impression upon the British people, mm -hmm. which lasts to this day. He has more fans in England, or as many as he does in the United States. It's really true. Mm -hmm. And with the book, the great interest in the book has been in the UK, as well as the United States. But what was interesting about all these various activities was, not only did they reach the civilians in England and the troops, our troops, mm -hmm. they reached the enemy. Yes. They reached, they reached both our allies in Europe, the liberated French people, but they broadcast also on a different network, the American Broadcasting Station in England, which was part of the Voice of America. They broadcast in the German language to the German armed forces and German people, and those broadcasts were definitely heard in Germany. And Glenn Miller was also popular there. Yes, but also, didn't the Germans also try to um, disseminate false information oh, yes. about Glenn Miller? I remember in your book, they were, talk they were kind of spreading lies about him, that he was in a brothel and all the rest of it to try and bring down his reputation the reason, among the yes. German people. When, when his disappearance was announced, mm -hmm. the Germans announced that the Allies were lying, that it was a plane accident, and that in fact he had been in France and had died in a brothel. Mm -hmm. It was a horrible thing to do because it wasn't true, number one. And, you know, obviously it was wartime and they're going to say what they say, but it was horrible. It was bad. You know, in a moment, we're going to return with Dennis Sprague, author of Glenn Miller Declassified. And it's, we could talk all day about this, <laughs> but we're going to take a short break and we're going to be right back. So stay tuned. Mm -hmm. Welcome back, and we have our guest, Dennis Sprague, author of Glenn Miller Declassified. 
fascinating book. And now I would really like to talk to you about mm -hmm. the actual disappearance of Glenn Miller. Well, let's be real quick about this, and then you can ask some questions. I'll give you a little overview. Yes. The band was in England. They had been playing air base concerts, which they had to stop playing because it got cold by December. You couldn't be out in hangars performing. So they were primarily involved with their broadcasting schedule. Much like he had wanted to get the band overseas, and Eisenhower came along and gave him a reason to take the band overseas. Yes. Otherwise, he would never would have gone overseas. Mm -hmm. He, once in England, he was chomping at the bit to get over to France once Paris was, Paris was liberated. And in this case, the, his command uh, agreed with him. Mm -hmm. Miller had appeared for air bases, 8th Air Force primarily, bases, bomber bases. And so ground troops, by and large, had not been able to see him. So they thought, what an interesting idea to get them closer. So troops on leave in Paris from the front lines or more importantly, the military hospitals, because we had built yes. several dozen military hospitals around Paris. They could visit those hospitals. And all that was holding them back was building broadcast facilities, or I should say repairing the French network broadcasting facilities in Paris so that the BBC could get a reliable signal from Paris to London, because their primary mission still was staffing the AEFP mm -hmm. division of the BBC. So Glenn won approval for the transfer of the band from England to France mm -hmm. and that it would be permanently located there. But again, they had to have reliable broadcasting. So the band, in addition to their normal schedule, which is very busy, pre-recorded 85 hours of programs so that there would be a backlog of shows in case they didn't get good transmission, they could plug in the pre-recorded record of the band. Mm -hmm. So they did all that and then the time came. It was mid-December. The band was scheduled to move on December 16th, 1944. Mm -hmm. Weather was bad. Glenn, mm. Glenn had travel orders. Niven gave Glenn travel orders to come over ahead of the band because the facilities weren't ready yet. And they were worried, and they didn't want to have the entire band, all of their personnel, all of their equipment, everything move, and then be stuck there. In other words, it was a big, the, it took three C-47 twin-engine transports to fly them from England to France along with all of their equipment yes. and their luggage and everything else. So that was considerable undertaking, so they, they wanted to do it right. Glenn was scheduled to fly over ahead of the band. He was authorized to fly on passenger flights that Schaaf, Supreme Headquarters, flew from London to Paris. There were 12 flights every day for VIPs. He was supposed to be on one of them. The weather was bad in France, not in England. In France, the weather was bad. Those flights were grounded. Glenn and the band were stationed at, a, at the 8th Air Force Service Command in Bedford, about 50 miles north of London. Mm -hmm. That's where they were billeted. And one of the officers there had a small utility plane, a C-64 Nordine Norseman. And he and his pilot <clears throat> were going to go over on one of the days that Glenn's flights were canceled. And so Glenn said to the um, officer, um, I'll hitch a ride with you. He wasn't authorized to do it. Oh, I see. He wasn't authorized. He wasn't authorized to go on that flight at all. No. Mm -hmm. So Glenn, the colonel, Colonel Norman Bazell, and the pilot, Flight Officer John Morgan, took off at 1.55 in the afternoon of December 15th, mm -hmm. and the plane was never seen again. Vanished. 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 I and and I remember there was the section at the end about where it, when his wife is um, when his wife is informed and yes. it coincided with a big event in their family. Yes, they had adopt they had adopted a son in 1943. They couldn't have children because of an operation she had had in 1930 end of 37 beginning of 1938. They adopted a boy in 1943, mm -hmm. and they decided to adopt a little girl in 1944 his younger sisters, Steve Miller and Johnny Miller, yes. very good friends of mine. Mm -hmm. And Helen had just gone to get Johnny two weeks before this happened. So she came home on December 4th and then on December 15th her father went missing. Well, you know, Dennis, your book was so informative, so meticulously detailed and researched. And I want to ask you a little bit about you know, your background and your involvement mm -hmm. in the whole Glenn Miller um, uh, 
uh, life, in his life. So can you tell us a little bit well, about the that? Well, the Glenn Miller Archives, <coughs> excuse me, was started by his daughter and son. It's at the University of Colorado Boulder because that's where Glenn and his wife Helen went to school. Mm -hmm. Helen graduated, Glenn didn't. That's the other thing about him. He didn't graduate from CU. He dropped out to join bands and be a musician. Although later the university gave him an honorary doctorate. So he is a PhD technically, <laughs> an honorary PhD. But, and Johnny went to Boulder, went to school in Boulder. Mm -hmm. So that was the logical place. Helen, the mother, and Johnny thought that Glenn's thing should be. All his papers, all of his re you know, recordings. He meticulously saved all his recordings. But how did you come <clears throat> to be asked to be the executor? Well, what happened was uh, uh, Alan Cass, who had directed the, the archives and was a cousin of, of Steve and Johnny's, he was, um, his mother and Helen Miller were first cousins. Mm -hmm. um, Alan and Steve and I became acquainted over the years, mm -hmm. and, and eventually Steve entrusted, Alan entrusted mm -hmm. me as his successor, and Steve entrusted me as his, uh, as his successor, so to speak. And both, unfortunately, both of them, my two closest friends, are now gone, and I'm the survivor of that. Well, I'm curious, you know, Part of the show also examines the whole writing process. How long did it take you to write this book? Steve asked me to do the book in 2009 because one of the latest Glenn Miller conspiracy books came out at the time and it was one of the most egregious. As you mentioned, there were scurrilous rumors put out by the Germans mm -hmm. in 1944 about what happened to Glenn. Yes. And then because of the nature of the fact they never found the airplane, mm -hmm. the, the, the military did do an investigation. I point that out in the book. Yes. It's published for the first time yes. ever. Mm -hmm. No, I found it, and people say, how'd you find it? How did you get into it? I said, well, I'll explain all that, and I will explain it to you in a moment. But there were all these rumors over yes. the years, and many authors that had just gone out without any real proof and made outlandish claims about Glenn. Mm. So Steve said, I'm done with this. I don't care how long it takes you, what you need to do. You have my permission, do anything you want. Find out what really happened to my dad. And don't, you know, don't pull punches. Whatever happened, happened. You know, mm -hmm. we can deal with it. So I got full cooperation of the military, because it was Glenn Miller, and the U.S. Amazing. government, and the British government. Amazing. And because one of the theories had been that British bombers had accidentally hit the plane with a bomb jettison. And so the British were anxious to clear the RAF in fact, if they hadn't actually done it, yes. or they were anxious to prove it if they had actually done it. So we found out that without any doubt, the RAF did not bomb Glenn. I got a nice letter from the Ministry of Defense thanking me for clearing them. It was very fun, it was cute. But <clears throat> Go ahead, I'm well, sorry. But, so what I found was that if you go investigating Glenn Miller, you're not gonna find a lot of military records. To, and maybe this is why some authors and, and historians with good intentions mm -hmm. never found as much as we were able to with this book. But I think what happened was, and it took between 2010 and 2017, so that's seven years of work on this thing in yes. England and the United States. And, you know, primary research in the British archives, oh BBC goodness, archives, because yes. I had to put it all together. Right. It wasn't just Glenn was in England and the plane went down. Right. Why was he in England? Why was he even in the military? You know, mm -hmm. what, what was he doing there? So I had to get, get into all of that. You do a fabulous job of connecting all the dots. But what I learned in doing this as a writer and an mm -hmm. author, and I would advise anybody looking to write a biography about a, someone who'd been in the military, think military units and places, not names. In other words, if you look up Glenn Miller and you search, 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 you'll find some records. But if you, if you look up 2nd Army Air Force's radio unit, Army Air Force's service command, 8th, 8th Air Force Service Command, you know. Specifically where he was. Alkenberry, Abbott's Ripton, Milton Ernest. You look at place names, base names, unit names, then you find everything. That's amazing. And I found the 8th Air Force investigation into the accident. And, pri and I, no knock against my predecessors, but nobody thought it actually existed and that it had ever happened. They did investigate that accident. And several top officers who had allowed that plane to take off, knowing that Glenn was riding with that guy when he wasn't supposed to be, they lost their jobs. I can imagine. And procedures were changed. Heads rolled because... The head officer under Eisenhower, General Barker, who was in charge of administration at Schaaf, when they found out the plane was missing, which was three days after the flight, because mm -hmm. nobody knew, Glenn didn't tell anybody he was hitching a ride with the guy. The comment was, how the hell did we lose Glenn Miller? Well, think about it. 
Gee, did, did that, was, was that a rival <laughs> title? <laughs> now, we thought about that as a title, yes. You know, um, Dennis, in the last couple of minutes that we have left, I would love to know, you know, um, first of all, this book that you put out, um, are you... Are you, are you doing a lot of speaking engagements? Yes. So where can people buy your book, most importantly? Anywhere. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, it's everywhere. It's been everywhere now. So it's been out about 18 months, and they can get it at any of the major booksellers and some of the independent booksellers that they prefer. And I have a new one that's just coming. I was this going week. to ask you about that. What, what is your new book? Well, when I went after the Glenn Miller information, I uncovered a treasure trove of data on the Office of War Information in World War II and the military and the government, and it came to it, it dawned upon me that I needed to do a whole nother book about the overall effort. And what I ended up doing was a book about the media and the government cooperating in World War II to define American exceptionalism. And then, of course, the average people, Americans, of millions of Americans went out and proved exceptionalism mm -hmm. on the battlefield. But it's it's called America Ascendant and it's the rise of American exceptionalism. And it's all about the fact that President Roosevelt was able to put together a team in both private sector media and public sector that were all on the same page and working for the same objectives. And not only did the United States win the war, we won the peace. Because a great part of the book is about the occupation and rehabilitation and the kindness we showed to Japan and Germany. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of that. That's Incredible. Do you have a website, Dennis? Yes, dennismsprague.com. That's real simple, D-E-N-N-I-S-M-S-P-R-A-G-G.com. That's the website. Wonderful. And I know that you live in Milton and yes. that you speak locally, and it is such it is such an honor to have you on Thank the you show. Very much. How, just very quickly, in the last 20 seconds, how long did it take you to write The Rise of, Ameri of American... Yeah, America Ascendant, America Ascendant. Two years, it was a lot less because I already had all the information I collected for Glenn as, as a starting point. I wanna thank Dennis Sprague for being with us today on It's All Right with Suzette. Please look into buying his books and we'll see you the next time. Thank you. Mm -hmm.